Beijing or in New York or Canada or anywhere in this world. Um, first, I'd like to welcome to you all and thank everyone for attending. I am Dan Qingma, the president of Urban China Network at Columbia GSAP. And for today, let me briefly introduce Urban China Network and Urban China Forum this year. Uh, the Urban China Network is a GSAP urban planning based organization formed by students in Colombia. We aim to create a platform of communication and exchange for Chinese urbanism across multiple disciplines uh, through hosting events and bring together planners, entrepreneurs, government officials, scholars and students. Urban China Forum is an event which we host annually and each time with a different theme related to planning in contemporary China. If you're interested, please check out our official WeChat platform for the digest of speakers presentations from previous years. Thank you so much. And this is the eighth year of Urban China Forum with the theme Smart Cities and Info Universe. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors first. Uh, of course, Columbia GSAP and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and Minty Mentor for making this forum possible this year. Um, Weatherhead East Asia Institute is a hub for the study of modern and contemporary East, Southeast and Inner Asia at Columbia University. And Minty Mentor is a professional career consulting organization that gets international students to land their dream job. It provides networking opportunities and training courses, et cetera, or the um, related service to boost job application. And we are proud to host a two-day international forum here. And this is virtual meeting room with all of you, of course. Um, all right. Uh, urbanization in China is accompanied by a profilation of urban, urban data. Uh, contemporary metropolitics produce uh, countries, uh, con countless information and data which are then captured and utilized to inform the urban policies. In recent years, local authorities have planned for the development of digital industrial parks and um, have promoted policies in favor of the growth of tech sector, envisioning cities to be served by the data they generate, innovative interpreters emerge to provide data-driven urban governance and planning solutions. Uh, in this forum titled Smart City and Info Universe, we aim to analyze the impact of urban big data in global urbanization and to shed light on the future development of smart cities in China. Um, we bring us together and we are very glad to be joined by five leading uh, participants, um, the scholars, especially this day, this year. And for today, we are glad to have three of them in two groups. I think, I believe everyone see them in the, uh, in the video box. And Professor, uh, Professor Xin Yue will present on AI-driven framework for urban flood resilience geo design. And Professor Alan Smart and Professor Dean Karin will present on data-driven governance, smart urbanism and inequalities in China, security, surveillance, and informality. Uh, yeah, so prior to the start of their um, presentation, I would like to clarify the logistics. Uh, so we will mute of audience and turn off the videos during the speaker's presentation. Uh, however, please feel free to type in all your questions throughout the speech. Our UCM members, Shen, will collect the questions and read out to um, the speakers during the Q&A section. You can also raise your hand during the Q&A section, as well as to ask questions directly with the moderator calls on and amuse you. You could find a schedule in the chat box after each speaker section. And please remind it that the forum will be recorded and the schedule has been posted. Uh, yeah, and I would like to introduce Professor Xin Yue our first speaker of today's forum. We are very glad to have you here. Um, professor Xin Yue Ye is a, a Harold Adams Endowed Professor on Interdisciplinary Built Environment Science Research. He is Associate Professor of Stellar Faculty Provost Target Tire for Urban Computing at Texas A&M University. Also, he is a Director of the Urban Data Science Lab. His research focuses on geospatial artificial intelligence, big data, smart cities, and urban planning. 
He is one of the top 10 young scientists named by the World Geospatial Developers Conference 2021. We are very glad to have you here and please let's welcome, well, welcome Professor Ye. Ye. And you can uh, share your screen and I will stop share here. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Yeah, we can see that very well. Okay. So how how many minutes do I have? 30, uh, 40? Yeah, yeah. 30, 40. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, for me to uh, come here to give the talk. Uh, one year ago, I was still in the metropolitan New York because I was a, a faculty in the College of Computing in New Jersey Institute of Technology. So I have very diverse background. Before I came to US, I was a professional urban planner. I got a PhD here in uh, UC Santa Barbara in geographical information science. Then I moved to geography. Uh, later, I even become a computer science faculty. Only one year ago, I relocated to Texas e and University to join the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning, as well as the Department of Geography. So I, my research interest is integrated urban planning, geography, and computer science for urban sustainability. So, uh, my work these years, I mean, especially ongoing projects, uh, mainly supported by Microsoft and uh, National Science Foundation. Um, if you look at uh, these projects, it's very much is about uh, spatial decision support and uh, smart cities, especially after I came to Texas a and because uh, the Texas has uh, lots of challenges uh, two challenges. One is that's a, definitely a good thing is uh, the, the keep growing population. And so it would bring the burden to the built environment, but it definitely also uh, further expand many opportunities. But on the other side, uh, we have many kind of the hazards. Uh, one very unexpected hazard is, is February. This February is snowstorm. So we are working, it clearly gave us a picture is we need to work on uh, some uh, kind of a digital system, which is highly interdependent because on one side, uh, we have population and urban dynamics. On the other side, the urban extremes, uh, sort of extreme weather, and the, uh, also the different uh, governance uh, mechanisms across locations. So it let me think of like over uh, almost a similar time of how the, when the geographical information system was introduced in the United States around the, uh, the 1960s. Uh, the Mark Hug, when he developed the School of Landscape Architecture in University of Pennsylvania, he promoted the idea of convergence. So he not only hired landscape architects, also introduced soil science, hydrology, geography, all kinds of different disciplines because he strongly believed we need, need the uh, interdependence among disciplines to achieve the uh, kind of the optimal outcomes for landscape design. So this kind of idea influenced the geographical information system technology development. And nowadays, if you look at, like it's a recent uh, two years ago, the report from Princeton is uh, looking at the Houston, the urban sprawl will increase uh, rainfall. So in other words, we do need uh, the multidisciplines to understand in the coastal building environment, how different disciplines from the uh, kind of the climate science to urban science together will, will influence the kind of the 
sustainability and resilience of our communities. If you look at the uh, National Science Foundation, uh, kind of they have a web page called the Communities in the 21st Century. For that is putting together many and National Science Foundation's relevant uh, projects uh, for the to, which is to fund the urban re relevant research. I checked, I just uh, pulled down there are five major questions. Very interesting, very much relevant to the smart cities and the big data technology. Because first they want to ask how we can make the prediction, right? The second is ask what kind of theories. The third is how to serve the people. The fourth is if you have successful innovation, how can it be transferred to others? This question is actually is a very artificial intelligence question. That means how you can do the transfer learning uh, because we spend money mainly in the larger metropolitan areas. We accumulate so many experience how we can move the similar experience to other communities which lack technical support, lack financial support. Uh, the last but not least is how to engage communities. To engage communities to me is, is more like is how we can do the knowledge co-production, how we can do the co-learning, learn with other people. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, when we talk about smart cities, many times we are working on well-developed or well-established research questions. It's very much developed by scholars. But if you go to the field, you will have many open questions. You have many local data you have never expected. So how we can deal with that? So in today's presentation, I will show some of my uh, experience on that. And uh, one more thing is uh, I read uh, uh, there is a report. Uh, it's a uh, free for download from National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, published in 2019, talking about the building and the measuring community resilience. Actually, it's a mainly an action plan for the, uh, for the Gulf uh, research program, but it applied to most of the coastal communities. Uh, this report asks for three uh, action plans. One is we need to address the dynamic state of communities and their change in risk and resilience over time. So emphasize its dynamic change. Uh, second is we need to link the data information together. So this is, I will also emphasize it later. Uh, we have many scattered uh, data information, uh, separated efforts. We need to link them together. Third is decision making. And no matter how you do research, we need to uh, really benefit, the, uh, address the challenges from the communities. So we need to think about how we can better our decision making procedure. NSF, three years ago, NSF established a large amount of money for what are called the convergence access rate. That's, uh, that's another effort is turn research into action to uh, benefit the society. Very luckily, I was one of the first a group of researchers to receive this funding. And we, for that, we established something called a collaborative geo decisions. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, vice president for spatial decision support consortium. Now for that is because we realize for planning uh, from the top down, fish, uh, fish, uh, from move from top down to more collaborative collaborative decision making is you do need to uh, get in uh, many stakeholders, experts, local residents together to make a decision. However, we have many different terms of understand the world. We have different inches. We use different terms uh, because we, have diff we are from different disciplines. We even, though we speak English, but we speak different terms 
Now, how we can make each of us understand and make the decision transparent. So we are here, we utilize definitely the data is geographic information system based, but we also uh, implement new generations of knowledge, knowledge graph for the collaborative workspace. So you will see the examples uh, later. And uh, also, uh, last year, uh, I uh, published one of my books called the Spatial Synthesis, uh, Computational Social Science and Humanities. We invited the, a member of Academy of Science, uh, Dr. Goodchild, to write uh, the, the front page. He argued is nowadays uh, problems faced by humanities are more challenging than they have ever been, especially if I use uh, uh, coastal sustainability and resilience as example, because we have more people move, move towards uh, uh, coastal uh, areas, but we, we are not very much ready for so many extreme weather and the population pressure and definitely social equity. Uh, for that, we by nature is collaborative. However, for disciplines, is by nature is centripetal because everyone mainly focus on their own research question. We really need to reward the broader perspective. So, in other words, again, is how we link the connect the dots together. So if uh, based on what we have revealed so far, I can summarize, we have four big challenges now. What first is we have fragmented research. Resilience actually is mentioned in many, many disciplines, but uh, we really need, uh, and not only in different disciplines. The discipline look at things at a different scale. Uh, climate science is very macro level, but landscape architecture or architecture is a very building and a neighborhood skill. So how we can link them together is called a cross-skill holistic investigation. Uh, second is knowledge divides, as I mentioned before. Uh, scholars with different specialties, they tend to speak a different domain language and they have different criteria. And but we need really need something to be commutable. So how we commute, uh, uh, how, how we communicate these kind of the different ideas. Then we we'll come into the decision making uh, challenges for decision makers. Um, most of them will not really have time or knowledge to read all the uh, models, equations, diagrams, everything, lots of overwhelming um, uh, information, how to give them a very much, really much clear message what to do. So that's a, a, a third challenge. The fourth, as I said, fourth is not the least, is community engagement. How you can uh, get the public get involved and how to uh, raise their awareness and their awareness, how we can turn their awareness into data, coming back to the decision-making procedure. So for that, uh, there is a, some uh, um, initiative uh, solution. Uh, we, I have been doing develop a large scale knowledge graph to link the, the knowledge pieces together and also develop the information hub for collaborative and the collective knowledge sharing um, at its core of that is for artificial intelligence driven system to assist and facilitate the decision making. For me, artificial intelligence is not a come to replace people. Instead, artificial intelligence is a come to facilitate the human computer partnership. So artificial intelligence will really promote the collective decision making or collective wisdom. So eventually uh, we will get the uh, other general public involved and help the co uh, grow the platform together. So I 
when we talk about the, how the knowledge now is, is distributed across skills, I utilize that there is an article as example uh, by, I think by two Japanese scholars is, uh, is about, uh, they talk about resilient urban form, a, a conceptual framework. They very much in detail to list all possible attributes at from macro scale to uh, find very like a, an a, a, let's say the fine skill from macro skill they are looking to the here as I list I will not read through is from the uh, kind of the regional connectivity urban sprawl urban development type and then meso level is land use makes uh, the access to parks or open green space all the way to the building and block level. For each, to be honest, for each attribute, it's worthy a sub-discipline to explore that. And uh, I, I don't believe there is a one person who understand every attribute here or can handle the kind of the mechanism or theories for each of that. However, that's a reality is uh, this is a uh, can maybe still incomplete list of the knowledge we need to understand the resilience. So I will uh, come up a kind of something like called a resilience knowledge graph and say, hey, can we link everything together from the uh, from the uh, uh, there's a macro level like a uh, architecture all the way up to the urban planning from micro to macro and for that uh, we for example we can at, at the building level for example I just uh, use uh, some uh, things uh, given the size of a diagram I just pick pick up some representative indicators. For example, in the building, we need to know the foundation, structure, materials, information, and the neighborhood level. We uh, grab the a green infrastructure, there's a kind of a soil condition, vegetation. And when we go to the uh, more macro level, we are kind of uh, capture the flood plain information, vulnerable, vulnerability scores that together we form a kind of a big knowledge network allow us to do decision to at the same time we involve the expert and a resident. It looks like it is a beautiful conceptual framework how, but how we can really implement that. Um, definitely we have some belief is as uh, uh, pointed out by Balabash, he said Actually, the dynamics of many social technology economic phenomena are very much driven by individual human decision or actions. So now we really need to put the human into the center to develop the system. So that's, uh, it's uh, just due to the size of a diagram, we show the partial ontology for to understand the flooding. For example, based on the flooding literature, we, we, we develop the ontologies to see how, for example, if give a, given a house, what kind of the features of the house will it be relevant to uh, flooding? So for example, a house, you will see the types of house. The house is uh, what the, the relationship of a house. Where does the house attach to? What does the house next to? And the house itself also have certain its own components from foundation to story. So for all of that, we can link to uh, the spatial information or text information and uh, also image information. When they are linking them, we are developing something called a scene graph. The scene graph is uh, uh, some recent growth in uh, computer vision. So previously in computer vision, it will help you to identify the items in the picture, but a scene graph not only help you to identify the item, but they also help you to identify the relationship. Uh, 
So in other words, though it, this is a picture showing there's a, the house, car, but through the same graph, we not only identify which is a car, which is a, a house, we also identify their relationship. Say on the, uh, but uh, on the right side, you will see uh, building the relationship, say uh, which is in front of which, which is on the side by side of which. Since in, we have many such street view images and the pictures, and we also know each house information, and also we know which is linked re relevant to which, then we can build a huge connection from bottom up all the way to the regional level because when first we know the house is next to a park as a park is located in as for the census block group and this block group is in census check the census check is next to a highway the highway will link uh, multiple census checks together and uh, this highway, for example, will, always, will also extend to, to the coast. And the coast will link to other infrastructure for like a flooding uh, protection. So in other words, through these kind of the image, the text, the relationship, we can link all the elements together. And not only that, uh, remember, we also mentioned as architecture design. I, I, uh, I worked with uh, architects. Uh, for example, if you have a building here, can you list all the possible criteria telling us is, does this building has any uh, design go against the uh, flooding resilience or any design is a good feature to uh, promote the resilience? Uh, we have we also uh, changed uh, uh, thousands of these pictures to uh, allowing us to translate on one side the translate the picture into text. If we can translate the picture into the text, it means we can link the picture or link the design scenario with uh, many many of the laws of design. So if it functions, it means. Uh, even the two pictures looks like so different, but however, their design philosophy might be same or similar, we can link these pictures together. So it allows us to further strengthen the connections in the knowledge graph. So the good example is we develop an, an, an annotation, annotation system to allow ask the designers and the students and the local residents uh, to upload the pictures. And for in each picture, they are talking about how they feel about the design of this building, how good it is for uh, preventing from being flooded. And they just uh, use a natural, actually all these are natural language, is they just uh, use your common language to uh, type your comments. The good thing for that is, um, uh, I think everyone has the experience to search in, in Google. Their Google is not only, when you type in the Google, Google will not give you the same or similar words. Instead, Google return your answer, right? Because Google, why people like to use Google? Because Google is a semantic-based, semantics-based search. It means they try to understand what you want and reply it the answer, instead of send back the same or similar words. Why? Because Google is a knowledge graph based. So we are thinking about it, can we utilize that to build as something similar as a, as a Google, but we use a, a, the wisdom of the coastal uh, flooding resilience. Uh, so uh, when you throw in the pictures, I can match the similar picture for you. For example, in the left, I, if I load a picture on the left, the, uh, the, the, the leftmost picture, and my system immediately returns the, the right four pictures for you. If you just look at the right four pictures, uh, uh, I mean, the, at least in the, uh, the, the 
the first the two pictures are not so uh, no, sorry, the right two pictures are not so similar as the query image on the left. However, they have many they, their similarities because the front door, the uh, lowest floor has a similar design feature. It's immediately being detected and they return the similar images to you. So in other words, it's a kind of image intelligence. I can, by checking the same, they will return the similar image to you. Why we have similar image? Because I use uh, in the, through the I, des, I train the image, that you know what, what, whether the, uh, the design of the building is uh, consistent with certain uh, criteria. What does a computer do is they are going to look for the criteria, the text the criteria. When you have, for example, 90% or 80% similarity, I will return. I certainly, I can design it more complicatedly. I will say, based on relevance, I can even tell you what's the percentage of similarity. It's almost, think about now you search literature. The literature is also can be sorted by relevance. I, I can, I mean, image, I can also sort it by relevance. I can make it even more transparent, telling you is what's the percentage of um, similarity. So, so for that, uh, that's another uh, uh, important thing about artificial intelligence. Nowadays, we, we, we have big concern of AI is it's a black box. It, it especially, it cannot be explained, but as the low linking the, image to text and we can clearly tell you why we think it's the same then I is a highly explained it can be explained and not only that uh, because when we talk about a digital thing another bigger thing is we we do not have the lowest floor elevation information for most of the house I know there's two ways you can get the lowest floor elevation for uh, flooding uh, resilience. One is a, a fry Jones and a fry Jones. And a fry Jones, I mean, uh, definitely if you are a uh, wealthy uh, community, you might already been fried quite a few times to uh, help you to monitor the uh, building environment. And or you have the some building have building certificate. They tell you exactly what's the first floor elevation. But we have many long down communities. Uh, we we have many low income communities. Or we have places which do not allow you to fly Jones. So we have been thinking about some very inexpensive way to deal with that. We uh, recently we just published is. Uh, using the uh, Google Street View and the other uh, the image processing approach to uh, automatically retrieve the lowest floor elevation. And in case someone uh, want to curious why we need to know lowest floor elevation, because, because if uh, when there is a flooding, if the water come beyond your lowest floor elevation, it means your house is flooded. If your house is flooded, then your uh, property value will be immediately damaged. And, and given, I mean, definitely, if it flood in, we can have more equations telling you when the water going by inch, how much damage it will, it will bring to the uh, house. And if we go to a certain level, people cannot get out from the house, then there will be a life loss. And if one, one several inches further, the whole house might be brought down because of the pressure from the water. So this is certainly will allow us to understand the long-term impacts of flooding, uh, long-term impacts of uh, urban climate upon the uh, uh, real estate market. So this is a fundamental information. So we develop this technology and this is, uh, uh, because we, we just, uh, how we further understand the, to detect the lowest, the, the door in the building is we uh, uh, calculate, understand how Google Street View 
car pass by the uh, street, how they take the uh, photos, then use an uh, algorithm to recalculate, then you compute vision to detect the doors in the uh, building. And uh, certainly we have some detect some doors is accurate, some is, uh, is, uh, is wrong, but uh, we, uh, that's, uh, that's normal for computer vision task. We keep uh, updating our algorithm, training and using the, uh, uh, the, the correct uh, images as a reference to keep uh, enhance our algorithm. And, and for that, during that procedure, we also realized some more difficult thing because we call the data challenging communities because for the uh, uh, street view uh, images, for, I will notice that in quite a few, some communities, they haven't updated the street view images for many years or in some communities, there even no street views. So um, these data challenging communities also is a big uh, research topic in smart cities. Um, especially in the, uh, uh, like uh, for the flooding resilience, because if you do not have a holistic uh, picture of the community, uh, you only pay attention to the wealthy communities. Um, it's a bigger problem because uh, sometimes the wealthy communities are side by side with uh, low income communities or actually is a city as a whole is uh, you, you cannot ignore any other uh, uh, any building cannot be left. So we need to get hold of the, all this information. So for that, we are developing, uh, we are using as funded by National Science Foundation, develop as a, uh, a GPS enabled video uh, detection. So in other words, we drive into these communities to take the videos linked to with our narratives and other information and I'll uh, look at this is in the mid in the middle of the map. We use a, oh this is an example I used before for Akron. In Akron, people drove through the streets and they they talked about their perception of the environment. Then we can link it with uh, the images because these street views uh, or the images taken around the trajectory can be linked together. For that, we can build for that use is at that time for the, uh, for the looking to drug issue. But it's a similar thing we can apply to the resilience elements. As I said, if people say, hey, there is a problem of the resilient uh, flooding issue, they can always uh, speak up. However, people from different disciplines, they might have different perspective, local people versus experts. And uh, you can com consider on the top of two uh, that maps is people's opinions or their attention points are mapped by different color, meaning different group of people. Then you will see how, if they are highly consistent on certain location, yes, that's a place so we need action. But if they are highly like a divergent in certain locations, it's also worthy of notice. So we use that, we, we, we develop something called a geovisual uh, system is allowing people coming to a landscape to talk. When you talk, it will turn into transcript and even later you definitely you have opportunity to uh, revise your uh, text. So that means our uh, uh, understanding of the building environment will be combined by your movement the pictures, your perception, right? The mental space. So in other words, we have absolute space, a mental space, perceived space together. The, as I said, is we need to understand what other people also think. So if you ask different group of people to pass by the same landscape, based on what they described, the uh, the difference among them. So you will see how, how you can better coordinate everyone's uh, kind of interests because uh, uh, 
uh, when you bring people into the field, see what is, what's there and see their response. Sometimes even based on uh, interesting information, how, the, how long they stay in certain locations, whether they speak or not. See, what we did is, see there's a, a yellowish thing. The yellowish means people talk, they have some discussion here. So if they have discussion, it means they are interested in here. So even these, whether they talk or do not talk, how long they stay in certain location will also reveal people's attention or their understanding of the landscape. And so definitely for uh, someone might uh, think is whether there's a uh, kind of the, uh, 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 what I say the privacy issue. What we also consider that is developing a polygon, a more larger polygon to hide information inside. So in other words, if you are in each of these polygon, your information will be uh, 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 the same. So we will not, uh, the information inside will not have any difference. It will be summarized. So we also using, uh, as I said, there is uh, many ways we can use natural language processing to link these images together. So we also develop some keyword traits to link the, the urban images. So remember when you, uh, travel into different locations of urban building environment, you will always have a feeling as, you, as if you go back to your hometown, or you remember that you saw it before, but you cannot remember, or you went to uh, a park, or uh, you, you uh, walk to a neighborhood, you suddenly you feel you are inside, it's, it's as similar as your, uh, your house. Right, you will find out some many similarities. So it allow us to link pieces in the uh, building environment together. So uh, if, uh, as um, Michael Betty in, uh, I think three years ago, he published a book called Inventing Future City because he said it's things, for many years we were talking about how we predicted the city, but uh, given the many inevitable technology, like as Kevin Kelly mentioned, we have many technological forces that will shape our future. Can we, instead of model our city, can we invent our future cities? And for that is I, I just started my new National Science Foundation projects on digital twins, uh, the Texas A&M homepage also report my project, what we do is we develop a digital twin for the Texas coastal communities to promote the resilience. And for that is uh, we, what we do is because as I early in my presentation, I mentioned in early February, uh, Texas has a, a unexpected snowstorm. And uh, the after snowstorm, you need to report your loss. However, after several months, quite a few communities still have not reported their loss due to the, the lack of technical support. So we are thinking about uh, since Texas has experienced so many all kinds of disasters, can we build a huge uh, disaster library uh, using the integrated uh, big social data and the weather simulation to, to have a quick estimate of damage. So it will allow the resource to, to be quickly uh, deployed. And for that, we receive the support from Microsoft. Uh, so, so as I said, uh, when we have all these new advancement of technology, we really need to link it to the uh, location and it need to be put as a knowledge graph to connect things together. However, in the center of that is human being. And for human being, I'm not only talk about individuals' perception, I talk about many different people's perceptions. So for each of us, we have different knowledge. I appreciate everyone's knowledge. So our purpose is building a platform allow so everyone's knowledge can be merged, can be become a much larger uh, uh, knowledge graph. So uh, uh, 
I mean, we uh, in, in in China we know the all the things. The three common ingredients, the Zhuge Liang, uh, three common persons. The knowledge will be much stronger of super than uh, one wise man. So the uh, so the knowledge co-learning is uh, through can human computer co-evolution. It will make our system much smarter and uh, sustainable. So for that is. Uh, this is a big, actually my big dream of in the future, how the smart cities should function. Is on one side, we need a link the make our uh, the system more uh, can be explained. So it means we need to have uh, link many diverse data and clear links, putting things together, but also facilitated the communication among different stakeholders. And uh, since many information from different disciplines, we need a knowledge graph on behind to make it uh, 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 closing the gaps. And we are developing more data fusion uh, modeling uh, skills to uh, linking these elements uh, together and engage and people because uh, I, I fully believe with through that is uh, if we grow our wisdom, grow the clarity with technology ability, the system will also grow. So the software will become smarter because of human become more collaborative. And uh, the, the things today, I do not have too much time to talk about the uh, how we integrate the climate data with uh, uh, local data because that's relevant to downskill, uh, sk downskilling uh, technology to link data across skills. For that, I would say we will need we we will integrate the social and the physical convergence for digital twin, and uh, if it functions, it will allow us to have many fantastic applications uh, in the for coastal resilience. So I think that's all for my talk. Uh, thank you, and uh, any any information. Any comments, any questions are very much welcome. So participant, you can raise your hand and I will uh, ask you to unmute. Uh, you're unmuting me. Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm Thad Pulaski. I'm from the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia University. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that presentation. That was really um, enlightening. And the image capture software for the doors of the buildings is something that could be really useful in New York. We don't have a good idea of, first of all, like how many people live below the flood elevation. Like we know where their health when their houses are in the flood zone, but we don't know necessarily if their first floor is above that base flood elevation. We also don't know if people are living in basements. So this, this image recognition software would be a great addition to um, this platform that the Center for New York City Neighborhoods has already created called Flood Help New York, which intended to do this, but it didn't have the um, machine learning piece. It does like bring together the other flood risk data with like, um, our municipal data about property. So just don't know where that first floor is. So that's great. Um, but I did wanna ask a question um, about the, um, the, the perception, like community perception of a place and how, you, um, how, how we can use that data to better understand community resilience. Um, because there's been a lot of debate, at least in my, my working world, which is like some of the urban resilience people in the Rockefeller Foundation and other otherwise about measuring um, community resilience and how it how it can be achieved because it's the, a lot of the a lot of the data points are very subjective. And then this perception of community health or community resilience or just safety in some cases, um, that sometimes that data is really hard to trust because perception makes up so much. I mean, bias often informs our perception, I guess would be a simple way to say what I'm asking. And how do you like correct for bias? And how do you, how do you sort of distinguish perception 
knowledge and what what we often need for like community conversations about resilience is like sort of a collective wisdom <laughs> that isn't necessarily based on like um uh you know my individual perception but something that like as a community as a collective we agree that like we need to get the drugs out or whatever you know so I, i'm gonna stop there and let you respond but thanks again so much for this wonderful presentation appreciate it thank you thank you for the wonderful uh questions and uh, uh comments and the first is about the uh first floor elevation estimation so for that is, uh, uh, I, I will be very glad to share the, my other thoughts later, is uh, we, we, are, we are now largely implementing this kind of idea in Galveston Island. If you everyone know Galveston Island is, is very frequently studied in the national literature for hurricane because it's an island, it's, it's just uh, uh, near the Houston. Uh, so we use uh, uh, Galveston Island as a test bed nowadays. Is use my technology to verify with their uh, building information, and also they also fly drones uh, to get information. We are verifying these uh, three different data sources together to see whether we can come up with some really uh, inexpensive way to identify the uh, to identify the lowest floor elevation. So I'm more than happy later can discuss with you is how we can use uh, similar ideas in New York. Uh, I, I have some other projects also going on with uh, New York is uh, using uh, New York's uh, open data to understand how the business, uh, the, the resilience of business to uh, every disaster. For example, no matter is a hurricane, but also like a public health crisis how it will impact the business operation in local business operation in uh, New York City. Uh, okay, so that's one thing. A second thing is about uh, the perception. I, I totally agree is uh, if you ask people for their opinions, everyone will speak up of their interests. And then now sometimes sometime it's hard for us to differentiate what is uh, the interest of the community, what is the interest of individuals. Uh, so I, I think uh, certainly when we develop the decision-making uh, tools, it's not uh, help people to, uh, let's say, it's not make a decision for people. Instead, is, is you can consider why we need a pull thing together is for, uh, 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 let's say, to help the decision makers or other experts to better understand what why there is so diverse uh, thoughts about a location. Uh, previously, many of these information are stored in the meeting notes, or uh, you bring people in, they just uh, talk. And after talk, everyone forgot what other people is, uh, is opinion is. So we, for that is we want to link everyone's opinions to locations to to the trajectory and um, uh, uh, there is one other benefit is when you're putting uh, people talking together uh, nowadays the uh, natural language processing skills can also find out how much you repeat your opinions how uh, to what extent you you go against yourself in the uh, the statement because previously in decision making, we use some using some very hard numbers, ask you to do some selection, uh, kind of quiz selection to find out how inconsistent a person is. If you are too inconsistent, then I need to disregard the person's opinion input. But for that is uh, sometimes too arbitrary is because you only use several quiz we try to understand whether people can see or not you need to let people talk so so i so you know as a, so what we do is you just let people to speak up as much as possible using the natural language processing to detect the inconsistency use natural language processing to to extreme their like a topic they are like a main arguments. Then we go to overlay with other people. 
we strongly believe is if we can select a representative samples from the uh, community, we, and I, I believe we will be able to, if they cannot find out their common concern, if they will represent something is commonly represented by the discussion, it will, it, it's really valuable, um, right? So it's really will be very valuable. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Sorry, yes, absolutely. That was a great answer. It's so interesting. I feel like we are in this world of convergence already. Right. And so um, like the perceptions that are put into Google Maps or um, to like, you know, that are fed through social media are already informing and influencing our opinions. So in a way, like how this translates in a positive way to the urban sphere is something, you know, I feel like it's already happening, but like maybe if we could design it so that it didn't live at the hands of like Google, but was like more or Amazon or whatever big tech, but if it could be like more of a, you know, a citizen led initiative, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but um, because I, I do worry about that. Like, I, I feel like maybe, you know, I like walk score or other attempts to sort of evaluate an environment based on community based on perception have resulted in like a kind of a reinforcement of some racist and otherwise like um uh you know like historically informed biases or like his you know like um and instead of you know the the translation that often happens in the community engagement sphere which is not taking people's perceptions, but oftentimes people's like aspirations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, 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 I guess think uh, following yeah. what uh, your question, I today I, today in the presentation, I forgot to mention another point. Why this kind of, well, why I bring these thing convergently, convergence in location has another great benefit is sometimes we, I, as an urban planner, I visit the local community. We find out the, some people are so knowledgeable about their local issues. I was just wondering if the other community also have such a person, it will be great. But uh, since we, most people only live in their own communities, in their lifetime, they stay in their local communities. So how wonderful this knowledge can be transferred to other similar communities. So I mean, the similarity is when you have more this kind of data, you, how we know similarity is not only by picture or language, it's based on the essential knowledge graph behind that. If we find out that the two communities at least have 90% or 80% of the similar and one community, for example, has experience to deal with a snowstorm, the other community has never experienced that, but one day suddenly because of extreme weather now have snowstorm, weather experience I can borrow from. So if, oh, I have a digital twin, though it's not a 100% the same, let's say it's a 90% the same in somewhere else. And let me quickly to borrow what they deal with a snowstorm for me to make a, uh, I mean, a borrow the experience for decision making. Thanks so much again. It was a great presentation and great responses. I appreciate it very Thank much. You. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, if no one have a question, I will go with a question. Um, so how do you see like the challenges from like scaling the like a project, like a Galveston Island pilot project to uh, a larger city like Houston or New York? Okay. so. Uh, at this, uh, that's, a, that's a, a certainly a greater question. Um, we, uh, uh, this year, I'm as a, a senior personnel, we received $5 million from the National Science Foundation to 
build a high performance computing platform for emerging sciences. So, um, because I wrote part of the need for do the coastal communities resilience modeling, that's an, uh, uh, certainly is a, is a priority, one of the priority for this funded project uh, for the uh, deal with uh, extremely large scale computing. Um, uh, yeah, I know many people will ask is when you deal with uh, Ireland, then you how expand to the metropolitan area. Even I would say how I will expand to the whole uh, Gulf Coast or the, the whole coastal area of the United States. It suddenly is uh, the, the, the purpose of high performance computing at the same time is uh, the data structure thing. Uh, for the, today I showed the example of the, uh, our the trajectory mapping by trajectory, our geovisual uh, research. For that, it has been funded of, by my three previous National Science Foundation projects. And for that, we already developed some database structure and the media compression technology to deal with huge amounts of data. Because today I haven't mentioned one thing is when you send people to the field, then you ask them to talk, speak, and upload the video. The video will be, size will be very large. If you, if you went to a place without too much internet connect, connection, how you can easily upload this data? So we already solved this problem. Yes. So. Uh, we, we have the technology. Thank you. Um, any other question? Um, you can just, if any, like any participant have any question, you can just raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, one thing I want to add is the, the reason we use a Gavinston or Ireland or as a case study is we want to use that island to test the convergence ideas because we want to use that to get the input from local people, officials and various amounts of data together to build a very comprehensive digital copy of Gaveston. And when it functions, then the other cities can follow the similar way, but, uh, but we, we do not value the computing uh, capability uh, too much because we already developed the data structure who functions very well. Uh, yeah, the only reason we use Gavispan as an example is we want to use that to test a comprehensive digital twin. We make sure it functions, then we use a much larger city and the metropolitan area to, to run the uh, model. Yes. Any any other questions? All right. Um, if there's no more question, um, then um, we will have a like five minutes or like around five minutes break, and then we'll come back with the second groups of um, uh, speakers. So uh, now is 10, 10 05 and we'll come back at 10, 10. Um, if you have more questions, please, please like text in the chat box um, or you can save it for the like panel discussion that involves all three speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Thank you.
All right, let's come back together and let me check if which room has more. the screen all right uh, thank you so much professor Yi, for the presentation q a section and thank you Shen. uh thank you all the questions we have and now let me introduce our second and last group of speakers of today's forum um, professor Alan Smart is a professor in Metros in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Calgary, Canada. PhD in Social Anthropology from University of Toronto, 1986. Research interests include political economy, housing, urban anthropology, smart cities, etc. He has conducted field research in Hong Kong, mainland China, and Canada. He's the author of Making Room, Greater Clearance in Hong Kong, and also other publications. Professor Dean Corrin is an associate professor of sociology at University of Calgary. He has previous degrees in economics, the philosophy of social science, and a PhD in sociology. His research areas include race, economic sociology, social theory, and inequalities. He also has many uh, incredible publications in the British Journal of Sociology, Economy and Society, etc. Um, uh, Professor Allen and Dean would present the topic Data Driven Governance, Smart Urbanism and Inequality in China, Security, Surveillance and Informatically. Let's welcome our speakers and I will stop sharing my screen now and Okay, can you see it? Yeah, yeah. We can Perfect. See it. Okay. All righty. Okay, so uh, as you thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as you've mentioned, our the title of our talk is Data Driven Governance, Smart Urbanism, and Inequalities in China, Security, Surveillance, and Informality. All right. So Broadly, what we're going to do in this paper, firstly, we're going to briefly discuss the rise of smart urbanism and data-driven governance in China. Secondly, we're going to propose a risk class as a, a prism to evaluate these changes. Uh, then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Alan Smart, and uh, we're going to talk specifically about some of the dynamics of risk class and digital governance, including impacts on security, surveillance and inform informality. All right, so um, what we're seeing here over the last decade in particular is the rise of a new form of governance, which has been called uh, data-driven governance. And this has emerged alongside with uh, smart urbanism. Uh, and this, the current form of data-driven governance, I mean, of course, you study people like uh, Scott seeing like the state and uh, Ian Hacking, you know, Foucault, uh, there's a kind of uh, Giddens as well, this long idea of uh, information as being fundamental to state governance and state control, right? But uh, what we're seeing here is a kind of new form of this is specifically uh, in terms of um, the use of big data and artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, this is particularly the case in China. Uh, lots of studies have shown, uh, at least there's lots of research coming out, you know, some of it, a lot of it in newspapers, things like that, to show how much data is being produced in China, collected, and, and used to train uh, algorithms. So just one example of this is that China uses 50 times more mobile money than the US does. Um, and we can see with the, uh, the FT um, graph right there, just the, the massive difference between the two. And uh, mobile pay is a particularly significant uh, source of uh, big data information. It, provides not only information on what people are purchasing, but it's also geolocated. 
which can in turn uh, facilitate uh, governance projects such as the training of cutting edge AI systems, such as those used in Alibaba's a city brain, uh, which have become more and more popular, more and more used, uh, not only in China, but in other places as well. Um, so not only are we seeing uh, data produced and collected in China, we're seeing also a, a subtle shift towards um, China in terms of, maybe subtle is not the word actually, significant shift uh, in terms of the development of these algorithms uh, in China by Chinese companies. So while much of the technology is uh, produced by Western corporations such as IBM and others, uh, Google's also involved, uh, the usual uh, suspects, um, increasingly cutting edge technology is always also being developed by Chinese companies such as Alibaba, Tencent, E2, Ant Financial, and I should mention uh, Huawei as well, right? So um, the centrality of big data to machine learning uh, uh, forms of AI is, is giving China a significant advantage because of the larger size of the population, much greater adoption of mobile phone shopping, and, and at least until very recently, um, you, less uh, restrictions on privacy uh, and use of data by government and corporations. Um, and uh, you know, we know about the new, um, new privacy regulations coming out in China, uh, and we'll have to see how these work in practice. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been a, a massive advantage for the amount of data that's been able to be collected in, in China in terms of uh, pushing forward on data during governance and smart urbanism. So one of the things we're proposing here, and I definitely, uh, of course, all of this is uh, co-authored between Alan and I, but I think in particular, uh, Alan's been really important here in thinking about this, um, is the idea of provincializing Western smart cities. Uh, there's a long running tradition, which you, know, you can be traced back to, uh, uh, Marx, among others, that um, I mean that the West is basically the most uh, technologically developed. Which you know, in the 19th century, in that context, um, it's under uh, you know you can see how Marx would be seeing that in terms of the development of the capitalist mode of production. Um, and the idea here is that we what we still see as a kind of lingering effect of this is a lot of focus on Western smart cities, and, and in particular, a lot of focus on Western smart cities as at the cutting edge. And uh, I mean, there are a couple kind of very famous uh, cases from Asia that are used, but what, what we're suggesting here is um, um, really, given how much of the cutting edge China is, is getting in terms of the employment of smart urban uh, technologies and big data and AI that we might want to see it the other way around. That when there might be a kind of use in understanding what kind of future for the entire world uh, are Chinese cities uh, generating. Uh, okay, so in terms of smart city projects, again, this is very high level, very brief summary. Um, already by 2015, there were 311 Chinese cities implementing smart city plans. Uh, with claims that already 158 of them have been built. Admittedly, and, and this is important in all the things we're saying, I think it's important to identify the new, acknowledge the new and the novel, but often those things that are new or novel are, are overlaid on top of existing. They, they never made kind of ex nihilo out of nothing, right? They're generally overlaid on top of existing structures. So uh, admittedly, many of these uh, described smart cities were kind of token or rebranding of other uh, initiatives such as eco cities, digital cities, creative cities. Uh, nevertheless, though, if we go beyond the formal plans um, and consider data-driven governments more generally, which is not only instantiated in the city, but more generally in, in any kind of state governance, China has probably moved faster than anywhere else in the world. Um, and again, this ties us back to the issue of big data. So of course, we've you know heard this uh, oft uh, said analogy in the last few years that big data 
uh, is the kind of fossil fuel of the 21st century. Uh, in particular, what we've seen uh, since 2016 is Alibaba has been slurping up video feeds, social media data, traffic information, and other data, um, from, for example, from Hanjo uh, for its City Brain project. And, and not only have they been developing this project within cities, but they're starting to export this technology, uh, not only to Macau, uh, but to Kuala Lumpur, uh, and potentially some other uh, cities as well. And so what we're seeing here is a kind of scaling up uh, as an exportable urban governance package with a kind of homogeneity of the basic framework, but then value added customization. Uh, and here is a, one example of the kind of um, uh, view of the city that can be provided by these types of technologies uh, building on a massive amount of data to, to, to simplify, to provide a few key categories. And this is, uh, again, City Brain, which has become uh, extremely, extremely popular. I mean, one recent article uh, said that, you know, almost every city official is trying to get a City Brain uh, within their city in China. So uh, as I've mentioned already before, um, Privacy has so far been a huge competitive advantage um, in terms of weaker constraints on uh, government and corporate use of personal information. Um, the, the new kind of consumer uh, privacy rules are, it's still very early to tell, but again, these don't put constraint on uh, government use of data. So oh, generally it's still a, a kind of significant advantage over the West, especially when you compare it to the projects like uh, Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. Uh, I mean, ultimately the whole project just ground to a halt uh, uh, because of concerns over privacy uh, and, and, um, and pr rights of revolving around privacy. Okay, so that's a kind of you know, brief overview. Um, one of the things that we're trying to, to propose here is how to think about the new forms of inequality that are emerging from this, how to provide a kind of categorization or a kind of how to make them more intelligible and to be able to, um, and how to make them commensurable as well. I mean, there's so many different processes going on, so many different effects. Uh, how do you try to make them, you know, how to try to make these understandable? Um, so one of the things we're proposing here is this concept of risk class. So uh, the concept came out of a debate that I had with uh, Ulrich Beck in uh, 2013. Um, and so it basically builds on Beck's idea that risks like wealth are the object of distributions and both constitute positions, risk positions and class positions respectively. So this is from uh, Beck's um, not his first book, but definitely his kind of his classic work, Risk Society, uh, which was written uh, in published in Germany in 1986. Just um, the, so the manuscript was submitted before Chernobyl, but came out uh, uh, just as just after Chernobyl uh, emerged. And uh, I, for many people, the uh, kind of Chernobyl accident uh, crisis was uh, a real wake up call that um, you know, capitalist modernity, uh, technological development wasn't only producing goods, but really producing the potential for significant risks as well. So in thinking about this idea of a risk position, um, you know, we need to think theoretically and empirically about what, you know, how do we generate this idea of a risk position? And so what it involves is needing to integrate a multitude of socially produced risks into a systemic social position of disadvantage or advantage. And the key here is that despite lacking the kind of commensurability that economic goods, and in particular, exchange value generally generates. So you know, when it comes to the distribution of goods, the primary reason why we can make them commensurable and, and kind of give a general class position is because they're tied to exchange, they're tied to markets. And the, the more valuable something is, the more we can generally consider that valued. Uh, I mean, of course, the distinction between exchange value and use value is significant, 
Uh, but nevertheless, there's some kind of mechanism of commensability. As we, as we know, uh, they're extremely imperfect markets on, if there are any markets at all, on externalities and on risks. So it's a kind of both a theoretical challenge and an empirical challenge. But you know, as, as Amartya Sen has said previously, um, you know, we need to identify the core processes going on here first rather than just looking to build frameworks on what the existing data provides, right? And part of what we're trying to do here with bringing class position and risk position together is to address the systematic nature of not only the production, but the distribution of risk in modern societies. So you almost have like this double economy, the economy that produces goods, and at the same time, an economy that produces and distributes risks. Um, so uh, to be clear here, while the framework uh, built on uh, one of Beck's claims, Beck actually um, kind of undermined the potential insight of this work uh, by arguing that, um, that basically what would happen in the risk society is that the risks would be significant enough that uh, inequalities would decline. So basically, uh, what we have here, uh, you know, one of Beck's famous quotes is, uh, um, what was it, some poverty, poverty is hierarchical, risks are democratic. And, and the argument that I made in the debate with Beck is that um, while his model or basic framework uh, definitely can illuminate inequalities, he uh, employed an overly catastrophic account of risks. And this overly catastrophic account of risks just neglected the way in which even if things are getting worse for everyone, they often get worse for everyone in a highly gradational way, a highly unequal way. So the concept of risk class is meant to explore the interactions between class position and risk position. And to be clear, um, this, is, this is not a kind of, um, I'm not trying to reduce class to risk or risk to class, but rather to explore the interaction between the two. Uh, and so uh, in, in my work, uh, I've developed some kind of a toolbox of concepts for this. A lot of the work's been done in finance and environment, uh, risk arbitrage, organized irresponsibility. And one of the key concepts here, I think, to, to, that I constantly keep in mind is this idea of private escape routes from risk. And now, I was trying to think about a, a kind of very concrete and spatial way, I mean, you know, this is an urban forum, to, to make sense of this. And I, I think the picture, this is, of course, a picture of my book. I'm sorry, it's a picture of New Orleans, which I put on the front of my book. But I was reading the Financial Times yesterday, and I think uh, one of the articles by uh, Simon Cooper, I think, gave a great example uh, of a kind of um, urban... Uh, the spatial inequalities that you see with uh, private escape routes. So I'm just going to read you briefly this. Uh, this is about Miami. So he says here, the phrase climate, I, I just saw this last night, so I, I didn't put it in the slides yet, but uh, uh, forgive me the uh, brief interlude. The phrase climate gentrification was popularized by a Harvard study of Miami house prices in 2018. The researchers found that price rises in higher lying areas, such as Little Haiti, had outpaced those in lower ones like Miami Beach since about 2000. So again, this is, fits with many kind of stories, which is the salience of risk has continued to increase since the 80s. And you kind of see these tipping points since 2000. Um, back to Cooper. This is climate change ha hastening the gentrification of poor neighborhoods. Miami real estate agents used to ignore rising sea levels, then pretended the problem had been fixed by what looked like waist high garden walls. But lately, and this is the key element here, if you're thinking for analogies to think about spatial inequalities, but lately Miami market thinking is shifting from quote, location, location, location to quote, elevation, elevation, elevation. Uh, he also says, I also liked sell low, buy high, which is a, a little cheeky, but uh, we'll forgive him there. Um, and this kind of idea that elevation, uh, having elevated areas of land in high risk areas, I mean, this can be traced back to uh, uh, Wisner Al's uh, well known book uh, at risk and I I've talked a little bit about this in um, 
in Andhra Pradesh, what we're seeing here, this is becoming a more general process. The people are starting to be, the second those with economic power are aware of these risks and they become salient to them, they can use their uh, superior wealth and purchasing power to outbid others for these more secure social positions. And so the analogy you can almost think of is as, as a kind of auction, where if you have a limited number of secure positions, these generally uh, can be bid uh, for those with superior economic power. So, um, and of course we, we are well aware of the kind of inequalities that come with climate change in terms of those who produce climate change and those who bear the costs. Uh, a lot of the research has uh, focused on global inequalities, which is reasonable and significant, but um, the inequalities within countries, uh, which is highly correlated with uh, class uh, uh, inequalities, are in fact just as significant, or in many cases, much more significant um, um, in terms of the ratios as, as international inequalities. And so the, the kind of economic elite are not only an economic elite, they're also a risk class elite in that they can produce risks and then avoid them. So three key uh, goals here in thinking about risk class analysis. First of all, to explain existing identi identified equalities in new ways. Secondly, to extend the scope of systemic inequalities in new domains and to provide novel basis for normative critique of these inequalities. And, uh, and Alan Smart and I have already, I mean, started to try to do this. I mean, admittedly, uh, when you're developing new frameworks, often the, um, the data just isn't there yet and you have to work with what you have. Uh, but in our a recent urban studies paper, we tried to work on uh, th through some of these themes on uh, relating to social credit in China. I published a recent paper on uh, oil and gas as well. It looks more specifically at climate change. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is still a kind of emerging research program. Okay, so bringing it, you know, bringing it back to the very specific uh, topic we're looking today, which is uh, risk, uh, digital governance. Of course, this is Zuboff's uh, uh, very famous uh, book on surveillance capitalism. Um, what we're looking here is how things like surveillance and security that are involved in new forms of data-driven governance and the shift towards formality how those are increasing the advantages of those who already have security and social legitimacy. And almost you could say kind of dumping risk on others. Um, and as I've mentioned before, again, this is a really well-known book by uh, Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality. So, I mean, there is existing research. Uh, there's definitely a lot of existing research on um, uh, digital risk and inequalities, and, uh, but bringing the kind of risk class framework uh, is, is still emerging. Often these inequalities are layered on top of uh, the existing uh, configurations of private and public. And as always, the state is always mediating them. So, and that's another reason to have the kind of specificity of, of analysis when we're dealing with China, not just bring kind of existing uh, Western approaches to it because of the specificity of the type of Chinese state that not only has emerged um, since the 1970s, but that is continually being remade, especially in the last decade. And, and how we think about these things in particular uh, when it comes to the role and impact of algorithmic governance. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to Alan now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dean. Uh, and thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting us uh, to participate in this uh, forum. So uh, just to follow on from what Dean's been saying, uh, I think the process of kind of facial recognition uh, that's going on really illustrates the kind of things that Dean was talking about. So that Ch China has built uh, already by 2016, a really massive data facial recognition database of 1.8 billion uh, individuals at that time. You might wonder why the number is more than the uh, total population of China, and that's because anyone that passes through a Chinese airport gets added to the uh, database. So you're, uh, so that accounts for that. And uh, uh, so that you have the, and uh, the AI that's been developed makes it possible really to search this uh, almost 
unimaginably big database in just a matter of seconds and uh, recognize things there. Of course, you might ask uh, what's going on with COVID and everybody wearing masks. So uh, they, they, there's a lot of work being done that, on that, but also uh, moving beyond faces to what's called gait analysis, uh, the way you walk and the way you move, which apparently it's very surprisingly difficult to disguise your uh, gait. And so there's all kinds of other ways are, that are going on. So increasingly, Chinese police are equipped with uh, database connected cameras that allow them to scan faces and identify suspects. Uh, and there's been a number of notable cases where people going to a, a football game or a concert or whatever have been arrested as they go through the uh, uh, scan scanning system. What's surprising is that those cases aren't in the much larger numbers. So there's, again, uh, uh, as Dean said, uh, it'd be great to have more information. So we're kind of uh, looking in from the outside of what's going on. So the under implementation of that kind of tool of policing uh, is something that's uh, worth recognizing. Uh, and the other thing to kind of uh, qualify this is that uh, we shouldn't get carried away with just focusing on the technology because the surveillance system in China builds on paper file technologies that took form in the 1950s as the household registration system, the HUCO. Uh, just as Eubanks points out that the uh, automating inequalities in the US builds on all kinds of other uh, analog technologies of surveilling families through uh, uh, child and uh, youth protective services and things like that. So these are not new, but they're really adding on. And as Eubanks points out uh, uh, for the US, the digitizing and automating of these kinds of systems kind of makes it much harder for people to avoid the risk. So the risk gets very much amplified on those who uh, are already disadvantaged. Uh, next slide, Dean. So uh, one of the things that, uh, and as uh, Dean points out that uh, a lot of this is really under recognized in the uh, mainstream uh, smart cities literature and uh, things are moving very, very quickly and you have to kind of pay attention. So if you just kind of search smart cities, you might not uh, come across uh, what's been going on, particularly with Huawei's version of uh, uh, database uh, uh, govern governance, uh, so that they're promoting what they call safe cities. And so safe cities and smart cities are starting to merge in some significant ways, as Iona Data has documented for India. And uh, the smart cities are particularly being promoted uh, by Huawei and some other companies along the digital Silk Road, which uh, is extremely significant because of the uh, kind of global geopolitical conflict between the Amer America and the U and uh, China uh, and creating kind of divided digital systems uh, and increasingly the uh, uh, B uh, Belt and Road Initiative is creating a, a, an alternative digital governance system uh, for those cities heavily involved with the, the uh, BRI. Next slide, please. Oh, and Pakistan is a good example of that. So uh, I got involved in uh, this smart city research, uh, not directly, but because through, through informality. And uh, so uh, I want to explain a couple of things of why we're putting informality, because it seems like what, what do these two have to do with each other? And in uh, Professor Yez, really uh, interesting talk. He talked about data challenging communities. And I think uh, informality is basically the core element of uh, those data challenging communities. So uh, so I came to the question, well, what is, what is smart about a smart city? Uh, and there's a huge debate about the definitions uh, and largely it has come down to uh, an emphasis on the density of information and AI technology. So it's basically a high tech uh, assumptions about uh, that being smart. So smart becomes the technology, uh, but it really begs the question of what makes a city smart. 
uh, making traffic flow smoothly in a sprawling auto dependent urban region is a pretty limited conceptualization of, of smartness and uh, talking about uh, auto, you know, self-driving cars, the worry is that, you know, there's really smart technology, but it'll allow people to live even farther out so they can nap uh, or do work in their car while uh, the car does the automation. So the point is that it's really easy to do uh, very stupid things with very smart technology. And the best example of that is the 2008 financial crisis, which was based on some really highly paid, very smart people using cutting edge uh, uh, technologies of algorithms for uh, securitizing uh, uh, mortgages and things like that, and uh, ended up uh, really uh, col collapsing in a large part uh, the global uh, political economy. So just assuming that because you have smart people using great technology uh, is going to make a smart city really neglects uh, what is smart. Next, please. So that, that's where informality comes in. So the assumption really behind those who intervene in urban governments is that uh, the informal is backward, it's uh, problematic, uh, it should be either reformed or usually bulldozed and replaced with something modern or in the te uh, terminology often used in China, civilized. Uh, and uh, so one of my first uh, work within smart cities was really to ask whether formalizing uh, informal practices like uh, urban villages in China or illegal street vending and things like that uh, makes the city smarter or not. And it's a very big question, which is almost completely neglected by mainstream uh, urban studies researchers, because globally, at least 50% of all work in the world is done informally. And if we count non-paid work, like uh, uh, domestic labor within houses, it's probably more like 70%. Uh, in uh, places like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, even paid work is uh, about 80% uh, informal rather than formal. So the question uh, arises for me is, if smart city projects displace or erase informality, they'll have huge impacts, but will this in fact increase in urban intelligence? If not, those displacements may have extremely negative outcomes. Next, please. And so a lot of studies show that informal practices are better than formal institutions at meeting the real needs of citizens, particularly but not exclusively in the global south. So if you have a uh, this kind of a risk polarized uh, system uh, that mostly benefits uh, the middle class and up, uh, informal practices are often uh, crucial in allowing uh, those at the bottom end of the uh, pyramid to be able to cope and survive. If that's the case, and I, I'm convinced it is, then strategies that undermine informal economies make the livelihoods of the majority of the city dwellers worse rather than better. Uh, as, but as I said, most proponents of smart city uh, strategies either neglect informality or see it as an obstacle to an efficient and sustainable city. Uh, next. Uh, so uh, there's a big divergence between kind of work on uh, smart cities in the global north and the global south. Uh, in the north, they mostly ignore informality altogether. Uh, in the global south, it's often paid some attention, but usually as uh, examples of the things that have to be removed to make a smarter city. India particularly has taken this kind of approach. So you see more references to informality, but they're generally very negative. Uh, okay, and uh, so in China, you get a little bit more mention of it, but still it's probably more in the explicit smart city strategies like the global north uh, cities where it tends to be assumed, uh, uh, neglected rather than uh, talked about. But if you look at not just what we call explicit smart city strategies, but the implicit uh, smart city strategies that are part of the broader uh, big data based governance, what we see is that uh, China is very much uh, 
caught up in the idea that informality has to be replaced and that things like uh, urban villages are backward, they're problematic, and uh, they need to be replaced with something shiny and futuristic and modern. Uh, next. So that uh, implicit in this Ch China's projected urban smart urban futures futures is a lens that really sees certain places and people as parts of the past to be excluded, it, perhaps reformed, but largely uh, removed and replaced. So that uh, uh, in much of the world, in what's called elsewhere squatter areas, but it's kind of maps on somewhat loosely to urban villages, uh, there are lots of attempts at what we call it in situ upgrading to try and make uh, it uh, improved, often uh, kind of more user friendly than the public housing projects that are built on the uh, fringes of the city. Uh, and I point out here that if you Google uh, smart slums, you find almost no uh, references. And yet there's no, no reason why we shouldn't be using the same technologies to uh, optimize resilience and other kinds of processes of uh, mitigating risk in uh, low income areas, instead of just assuming that they are part of the past, eventually going to be replaced. So uh, my assumption and argument in, in our uh, work is really that uh, what's going on is that hundreds of millions of urban Chinese are still heavily reliant on informality and smart urbanism biased against these informal practices could be and largely is uh, being immensely dis destructive. Uh, it's good that uh, the, you know, the resettlement projects from urban villages uh, tend to be quite inclusive of uh, uh, at least owners of property within urban villages, often discriminating against renters uh, who are usually migrants. But, uh, you know, so there's good housing being produced usually on a more fringe area and a lot of the residents are happy about that, but it is really uh, ending a lot of the kind of vitality, urban vitality of uh, the informal institutions within the uh, city that old parts of the city or old parts of the fringe that have been incorporated in the city uh, and, and so on. Next, please. So I just want to conclude, and uh, Dean may have a, a couple of comments afterwards, is that uh, coming back to this idea of provincializing smart city research uh, is that in the context of mainstream smart city research, a lot of what's going on uh, in China is really uh, arguably kind of catching up, if not equal to uh, the sophistication of the technology in the West, but that it's also being implemented at a much faster rate, uh, kind of at Shenzhen speed of uh, urban development. Uh, uh, and that uh, with the kind of trade wars and sanction wars between Washington and Beijing, what's happening is the world is it's kind of uh, big data based governance systems are bifurcating, they're diverging in different ways. And that uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the Digital Silk Road is actually presenting a kind of a new uh, model for digital governance. And that uh, largely it's uh, so certainly I'm not saying that there isn't publications on Chinese smart cities in the uh, good journals, but they tend to be specialist articles. They're just about China. And then when you look at the broader arguments that are kind of unmarked, they're talking about smart cities, uh, China is uh, at best a footnote and often not mentioned at all. So uh, there's a real need to uh, point out how provincial Western smart city research is and that they're neglecting some really uh, big things going on. And I think the other, I have an, uh, this is a kind of an older image I use, but uh, the most recent numbers I've got is that Huawei has uh, over 200 uh, safe city projects, which involve 
basically at a, at a core of it is uh, cameras linked to uh, databases linked to the police forces. So smart safe city has become essentially a secure and uh, surveilled city, presumably uh, largely for the benefit of those who are already privileged. So the consequences of the types of smart urbanism that are being developed uh, in the con context of the Belt and Road Initiative, I think are really of kind of world shaping consequences. And we really need to pay a lot more attention to what's going on. So thank you. I'm done. Excellent. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Alan. Very fascinating. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start the Q&A section. So if anyone wants to ask a question or participant, please raise your hand. I will, um, I will ask to unmute you. Yeah, thank you. That's a fantastic speech and I really learned a lot, but I was kind of confusing because I feel like sometimes equity and say like safety are like contrary to each other. Um, even not to say in the topic of smart city, even in our like normal urban, urban planning, we it's really difficult to get some of some of groups like involved into uh, some kinds of planning, especially for smart cities, some kinds of like advanced technologies may be applied. Like say we have some groups of elderly people, um, it's really difficult to get them to learn how to actively use those advanced technologies to involve in either in like community planning process or any decision making. But we are trying to still use those smart city, the idea of smart city to apply to like all of our readers like equally and like no bias on any kinds of choice. Um, that makes me kind of thinking, is it possible or when the idea of smart city was raised, is it possible to like, we got some group of people first get involved, then we can use the technology upgrade or like after like 10 or 12 years, um, we got a, um, like either mode to like the face recognition to then ask like let those residents to passively get involved into those smart city idea instead of like ask them to actively enjoy um, the technology. Okay, um, why don't I uh, jump jump in then? Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a really good question, and uh, it's definitely a challenge. As you can tell, I'm pretty gray and. Uh, I'm definitely not at the cutting edge of use of technologies. I tend not to be on social media very much because my email does everything I need. Uh, so, but, uh, so the question is how you end up with what the Euro Europeans kind of uh, are emphasizing is smart citizenship. And uh, it is extremely difficult to get people to uh, participate, but uh, I think that is often the way in which the urban planning participation system operates, that uh, uh, even in North America, uh, there's a kind of a cynical attitude that this is all a token uh, exercise, that yes, you can express your opinions, but it's not really going to change what the urban planners are doing so that if you're busy and uh, you have to take the time to read uh, documents, download PDFs, uh, uh, and find a way to translate your way of thinking and your concerns into language that fits with what the planners have in mind, uh, then uh, you're probably not going to bother to do it, particularly if you don't think that anyone's actually really going to listen to what you say. Uh, so I think it's it's necessary to find ways to uh, make it easy uh, to participate. And in fact, that's what all uh, AI is theoretically about. It's about big data. It's about being able to include 
the concerns and issues of all of the citizens, not just a handful of uh, uh, elites, or at least it should be uh, feasible because you're, you're getting the technology, you're getting the uh, processing uh, capacity in order to uh, use information about what people are doing as opposed to what they're willing to say in formal uh, uh, participation uh, activities organized by uh, governmental ag agencies. So I think we need to find a way to implement it. But the one thing that is uni universal is if your community is going to be uh, demolished, people have things to say. So there are certain decision points at which it would be a very good idea to uh, use the uh, technologies that people are familiar with, like WeChat in China and so on, to try and uh, uh, tap into that. And uh, urban planners come from a particular background and they're probably not necessarily going to uh, automatically uh, be aware of the concerns. And this is there's a long uh, history of this uh, before smart urbanism of uh, resettlement projects that uh, uh, neglect what the real uh, priorities of the urban poor are. And there's great work done way back from the early 70s by the architect John Turner that shows that uh, things like amenities that urban planners tend to emphasize and kind of modern looking buildings are much less important than uh, central proximity to where the jobs are and things like that. So there are, there are, there are ways of incorporating uh, the ideas and concerns and interests of uh, more marginalized communities, but we're not very good at taking advantage of them probably because we're not that interested in uh, hearing things that don't fit uh, our, uh, our projects. Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent answer. I think and part of the issue here, so first of all, um, any new intervention is, is going to have differential impacts. I mean, the only way it wouldn't is if the people were the same. That's it. Like any new intervention is going to have differential impacts. And the hope here is to redress some of the inequalities, right? I mean, part of in I published this paper in Antipode in 2018. And one of the things I talked about was what is the relationship between uh, injustice and inequality? So is, is every form of inequality unjust? And it's actually a really, really sticky matter, like conceptually, right? Uh, emotionally, we might feel it, but when you start looking at it, it's very hard. We know there's a connection between these two, but what is the connection? So my proposal was, let's look at relational inequalities because we know those are problematic. And what a relational inequality is when the advantages of one, it, it's not like everyone's gaining, but some are gaining more than others. It's where the advantage of one is to the cost of another, right? And that, that to me um, kind of cuts through the, uh, the Gordian knot because we know those are problematic. We know that we know, and especially when we're adding new processes that are making the already advantaged more advantaged at the cost of the least advantage, right? And I, I think one of the, I've, I've been slowly reading Piketty's new book. He doesn't write small books. I don't know if anyone's noticed this. Uh, I think he needs to hire someone to abridge his books. But uh, I think one of the things he's really pushed on, and I think is quite an important reflexive critique for academics, and, and some recent French scholars have uh, started to point out how uh, the kind of merchant elite and the kind of cultural academic left um, actually share many common, like we, we feud, but we also in many ways share a common project of, of excluding others from uh, the, basically from the governance of the world. And, and one of the issues here, I think smart citizens, enabling people to have an impact and a say in how their society works is absolutely fundamental. And I think Alan's work on informality, that's a huge part of it, right? But sometimes when I see conceptions of smart citizenship developed, they're very much developed by people who um, 
are so immersed in the gown that they, they, they don't really, they're not really interacting with different cultures, whether class cultures, uh, you know, uh, um, ethnic uh, communities. And, and I think it's a real challenge to think that we can find one framework to integrate all of these different ways of communicating. And I think that's one of the issue with any kind of platformatization of, 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 of communication of information is we kind of either has to reduce it to this, uh, you know, to speak to the algorithm, but a lot of people just don't work. I mean, every time there's a poll online, it's people like myself, you know, it's people, highly educated people in universities who are vastly disproportionately participating, right? And I, I think uh, even what we conceive of as smart citizenship has to be rethought in a way I think that can, that can take much more seriously the informality and the time scarcity of people, you know, single parents, um, you know, people who are juggling. I mean, I feel busy, but I, I'm not even close to being really busy, if you know what I mean. And so I think it's a great question. And I think the most important thing is to keep this puzzle in mind and not to pretend we've solved it in a simple way. You know what I mean? To can, and, and not to think somehow because we haven't totally solved it that we can't make progress on it, right? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a comprehensive answer. Uh, I really enjoy the discussion of inform, uh, as an informal uh, built environment or informal uh, as a, Urban activities versus discussion of smart cities. It reminded me many other discussions on artificial intelligence side. Is a talk about the uh, the how to say the social how to say justice issues and the bias in artificial intelligence, because uh, uh, we in AI or computer vision we have quite a few libraries to label the urban images as safe or not safe or happy, happy or not happy, or they have many criteria. I would question who label these images. Have those people lived in these, something they call it informal human built environment, uh, really, I mean, live there. So, so that uh, problem is, uh, for example, I have visited uh, uh, quite a few, uh, the cities along the, co uh, the, the border of US and Mexico border. Many of these cities are very poor, but their crime rate is low. The reason is the generation live in the same neighborhood. They have the family honor. So they were, I mean, actually the crime rate is low. They're pretty safe. However, if you just based on the looking of the neighborhood, so you, you might think it's a, uh, high crime rate in the neighborhood, but actually it's not. So this will make us think is, do we need a smart city technology to change all these neighborhoods? Do you, do you have the job opportunities to afford those people to remodel all these buildings according to the need of technology? Apparently it's not. So I totally agree is, Definitely through the, we need more collective intelligence from artificial intelligence, as well as a human-centered uh, urban planning theory, help us to make our cities more as a living structure instead of it's a piled, compiled by technology. So what is the most needed is by local people. The interesting things, for many times we design a city. We are not the people who live in that city or community. So that's the reason uh, we do need uh, some platform. Uh, the computing platform allow us to collect more thoughts from people. No matter is a uh, very, so, so that's the reason we need to use natural language. Using all kinds of the, the signals from them, how they walk around, when they walk, how they talk, how they perceive, what they say, all kinds of things. So we will see the living, it's a, we treat the city as a man as a living structure instead of a mechanical machine. So yeah, so I, that's my uh, reflection on the, this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. And it's good to uh, hear examples like the uh, 
US Mexico border where there's been some really interesting uh, research about the, you know, the, uh, as you said, uh, uh, low crime, but uh, also uh, very poorly serviced uh, uh, communities that are often very much uh, stigmatized and misunderstood from the outside. And that's certainly something that uh, is pretty common throughout the system. My, my uh, doctoral research uh, was on uh, squatter areas in, in Hong Kong. So we were living there. And one of the things that was clear was that kind of the middle class assumed that they were dangerous places. And uh, a survey that was done by an NGO found that uh, uh, not only was the, objectively the crime rate uh, quite low, but that the perception uh, of the uh, people living there was that it was, uh, I think one third thought it was safer than the city in general. And about half thought it was about as, as, as safe as the rest of the city. And of course, Hong Kong is a low crime rate uh, city in the first place. So uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, there were lots of problems, but those problems were really ones that the uh, community couldn't really do with, uh, deal with by themselves, like sewage and so on. Yeah, um, I raised my hand, but I will speak to uh, I have a question for um, generally both of uh, our speakers is that uh, it's really interesting and really fun to see that the uh, the visualization part for Professor Yi's point, point is because we um, we think that we have seen this place before and we want to search for this place. And it seems like for me, the user, the potential users can be, um, for example, the young people and a more broader user group. But uh, on the other hand, I think the technology um, uh, productions are really expensive to afford. So I kind of wondering, like, what's the mainly Amy users now? So that do they facing the affordability of the product issues or um, what's the uh, like the future roads if the technology is getting uh, more and more easy for like larger publics to use? Uh, okay, for, thank you for your question. And uh, due to the time limit today, I didn't show that we developed this data collection device uh, through cell phone app. We already make it developed uh, the free app called Geo app, which now is if you search either in iPhone or Android, uh, it's free for download. And for that is for any people who have a smartphone, you can use that to go around in your neighborhood to talk. And uh, it, your, the, 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 your voice will be turned into transcript, link with your uh, trajectories. And we also have our uh, free to use software allow you to upload the uh, data, uh, upload the data to the, uh, the open, our open tools. Now for that is to facilitate people's data input. You don't, you can just speak or, and we also develop a new tool that allow people just use a finger, touch finger to access our visualization uh, platform. So, so as if is if you can drive, uh, let's say, you don't need to use a computer, the keyboards. You just, uh, as it, so if you can play with a digital device, you will be able to do that. But as you said, uh, as another concern is if for people who do not use a digital device at all, um, th at this time, our, we work with uh, uh, some, we began to work with some local communities in Texas. We do have people who do not use any digital device. Then we have our student, our uh, the volunteer social workers to work with them because that's another of my long-term uh, plan is I really want to bridge our international students with American communities. Because for many of them, after they came to US, what they realize is, for example, in Texas e &M, we are in a city of college uh, station. It's a typical college town. 
for many of them, after four years or five years of PhD study, what their understanding of US society is a college town. Or they definitely sometimes will travel to the big and the fancy cities for tour, but they never know the other small cities or rural town in the US, how they function. Uh, so I'm thinking of these ways how we can match the students with the local communities. And so they can learn from each other the life experience of from local people, from local decision makers. Through this digital device can be a commuting uh, medium uh, between them. So I, I'm thinking in smart cities or any kind of academic research is very much is to train people to be a citizen, to be a collab collaborative citizen. Um, just to, to follow up uh, on that, so that um, uh, just give an example of the way in which uh, ordinary people uh, without much education have been collaborating in uh, dealing with some of the issues that Professor Ye is uh, talking about, particularly in uh, Africa, there's been a lot of uh, effort put in uh, by NGOs to uh, fill in the invisible spots of African cities, because very la large parts of African cities are basically absent from uh, Google Maps, because there's no official streets, there are just pathways. And so that there's uh, uh, efforts to incorporate people, not just to uh, put, you know, you, could, you the technology will allow you basically to uh, follow a path uh, and describe the path and add it into a uh, collaborative map, mapping uh, software. And it's fairly simple with a, as long as you have a smartphone, apparently. Uh, but then you, as uh, Professor Ye suggests, you can also add in annotations and uh, describe the place and what are the uh, uh, key features and the kind of, all the kinds of things that uh, are often ava usually available on uh, Google Maps, but are completely absent in parts of the cities that don't have mailing addresses. So there's also some interesting work uh, being done on providing universal addresses uh, for places so that you can start to get uh, deliveries, which would be uh, useful during the pandemic and things like that. So there's, uh, there's, there is work being done, but it's still, it's, the funding of it is marginal compared to what's going on for, uh, uh, obviously, uh, profitable corporate activities. Uh, one thing I want to add is uh, map is not a territory. Even we use, a, for example, we have Google map, we print a Google map. It still is not sufficient for a community to use. So I work with my students saying, yes, in a, for example, it's a neighborhood. You can print a Google map if you can print a print of Google map, but we prefer use open street map. We can do more, more programming on that. Can we add the places where the elderly, older adults might easily fall down? For example, mm -hmm. some location, because Google map or open street map will not put these marks for you, but it would be very useful for seniors in the community to walk around. And for that is definitely some computer vision all the lead people, the experience can, oh yeah. So pay attention, there is a place, it's very easily you will fall down, right? So we mark these places out. Or you can mark places for like in Ohio, I think in many states we have safe to school program or seeing how we can, uh, I mean, kids can go to school safely. Then you also need to avoid, uh, there is a certain like a traffic issues or some sidewalk broken sidewalk. For that, no, no Google uh, Maps or open street map will give you such information. It's very much from the citizen cloud source the information. So this is also how to, this is a really good way to make our, how make our community much safer, much warmer, much welcome for local residents. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to build on one of the things Alan said. I mean, we had the slide about surveillance capitalism, and we haven't really talked a lot about capitalism in this uh, in, in our talk. We talked a bit about the state, but it's uh, any of these developments are always mediated not only by the state, but also by the type of economic organization you have. And globally, surveillance capitalism is dominant. And so 
if, if you look at the amount of resources that are devoted um, to things that are expected to, I would say, yield profit, or in fact, it, I mean, often the goal isn't necessarily profit in the short term, it's a net present value. So companies will often uh, incur losses in the short time to en engage in asset inflation, right? And, um, but things that are not anticipated to provide profit in the meso term, uh, or at least economic, I mean, Amazon still doesn't make a lot of profits because their focus is on building uh, their market share. And, um, and even things that start out sweet uh, I mean, just the whole digital economy is just filled with the bait and switch. Right? The second, do you think, I mean, WhatsApp is a perfect example of this, right? The way Facebook, and I'm not saying WhatsApp is a, a perfect tool, but it was shifted from being something in, in private between individuals to being linked to the Facebook, Instagram e ecology, right? So I, I do think there, there are important things going on there but uh, they're often, they don't have the weight of resources behind them that they definitely could, right? And if you think about the amount of wealth that, and uh, that's being created from this data, uh, very little of it is being devoted to these kind of issues, right? So. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for answering these questions. Um, I received some like private chat messages about more like with more questions about with regard to um, urban data, and it's like particularly urban governance. So, um, so one of the participant is addressing the like the part you mentioned that uh, a lot of tech companies are in China are applying um, smart city um, governance technologies um, in Chinese cities. So this participant mentioned that there's another online service company called Didi, which is the online service, like vehicle for hire service company uh, that went public in New York. And after its IPO, the company app was forced out the mobile stores. So the question is how the city travel data sort of become kind of a sensitive or something threatening <laughs> to the administration. Mm -hmm. um, What's your thoughts on that? Alan, you've done more. I mean, this is part of the battle between the, the, the two uh, digital giants, right? Yeah. Um, so I think DD is one of the examples of, of something that we're uh, writing about right now. And that's the way in which, uh, you know, I mentioned the kind of the fight between Washington and Beijing, but uh, uh, the tech giants in China are increasingly under pressure, not just from Washington's uh, sanctions and uh, uh, blacklisting and so on, but also uh, on the uh, tech lash, the te uh, technology backlash from Beijing itself and the crackdown on uh, free ranging activities of Ant Financial and Alibaba and uh, Tencent and, and so on. So that in uh, this is the kind of the divergence that we're uh, uh, talking about that essentially the uh, world is uh, seems to be on a path to having two very different digital governance ecosystems, one based in China, one based in uh, uh, the, the US and that uh, the uh, increasingly the technology giants in China are having to uh, uh, kind of uh, rely much more on the favor and support of uh, Beijing. So it's kind of supporting a much stronger state capitalist rather than free market uh, uh, approach to uh, digital governance. And so that the companies that aren't playing along like DD are, are being uh, punished so that the, um, the models are increasingly coming more directly from uh, Beijing, and I think that the new privacy law, data privacy law, is a big part of that. Uh, and uh, as Dean said earlier, how that's going to play out on, in practice will be fascinating to watch. But I think there's uh, even compared to when we wrote the urban studies paper, you know, things are uh, completely changed in in just two years in terms of what's going on in the d data ecosystems in uh, in China. So I'm not sure if I have an answer to that question, but I think it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, is there any other comments? 
Um, if not, I have another, like also another private message um, with questions. So, um, in, it's still like it's all uh, also about like the, the informality and the like urban villages been talked about in the um, uh, in the presentation. So you seems to discuss a lot of policies from the Chinese government is that to to replace those informal areas with more shiny quote unquote shiny urban areas, and you mentioned that people will be left out of this process, and it could be better if citizens like informal in the informal sectors could be could apply those smart technology and to could like sort of utilize those smart technology um the like this person is curious if you could talk about this like the inclusion process um in this like transformation or the like the transformation of technology from the more formal sector to the informal sector okay yeah uh, yeah so uh uh, I think when we're talking about uh, informal settlements, uh, you know, where you have a fixed uh, space and it's already being developed uh, uh, informally, uh, it's 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 a challenge to uh, incorporate uh, uh, infrastructure. But in some ways, the smart infrastructure is much easier to. Uh, implement than say things like sewer systems, improving the uh, street pattern. Uh, and so uh, there's lots of uh, ways in which one could take, uh, you know, basically all you really need is uh, wi wireless towers and the right kind of technology to, for example, give everybody their uh, own address to give access to, you uh, 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 things, but so far most of that—that's some of that is happening, but it's being used, often used in a way which is exclusionary rather than uh, uh, collaborative. So, for example, uh, a lot of the uh, surveillance technology is being done to try and ensure that uh, people have to have a hookah to live in a hotel, or to stay in a hotel, or to rent an apartment. And so that the African uh, population in Guangzhou, for example, uh, has shrunk quite uh, dramatically because it's very difficult for them, uh, even if they can get a visa, to find a place to stay because they're excluded from large parts of the uh, uh, accommodation possibility. So uh, as long as you have a system that is selectively inclusive, uh, for example, uh, uh, benefiting the original villagers in an urban village, as opposed to the, usually the uh, large majority of the population are uh, migrants uh, with only temporary hukou. Uh, usually they are not taken into consideration very much in uh, resettlement plans, in improvement plans. So the original residents are the ones who are kind of seen as the those to be included. There is there is some uh, moves. I've, I've just been uh, read a, a manuscript uh, for a book manuscript on urban villagers, and with the uh, new emphasis on a community what is it, community of shared prosperity, the uh, new mantra from Xi Jinping. There is more effort to equalize access to public goods uh, for both migrants and original villagers. But uh, as long as you have a kind of a strong exclusionary uh, attitude that these are uh, temporary people and temporary places, uh, I don't see an awful lot being done to kind of smart, uh, implement smart uh, technology, but the, you know, one, one will see, but uh, the trajectory seems to in China seems to be mostly replacement and uh, uh, re resettlement. Uh, and I would say one of the biggest areas of inequality that needs to be addressed is dealing with tenants rather than property owners within the urban villages. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering my questions. Um, any other more questions? All right, uh, so I guess I have a hand back to Denchi. 
Yeah, we'll share the screen. Ooh. Today's topic are so fun and thank you all for coming here. And also thank you for our audience here. It's been so great to have all our speakers talking about the sort of for me, the very insightful and the connection between the technology with equity data, the climate resilience, etc. all the heated topics uh, nowadays. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And tomorrow we will have two more speakers, um, Sun, Mr. Sun Tao and Mr. Yang, uh, Sun Tu and Mr. Yang Tao. And they will present us with the topic smart city business and technology in internet companies and um, also the topic uh, of the practice of city informa information modeling platform in China. Yeah, and thank you so much for today's being a long forum here and thank you for staying here and hope to see you um, the audience tomorrow and remember that there's a time changing because of winter time so yeah, we will also make announcements. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the organization. Right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you to you. the Holstein professor. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye